So my name is Erin, and um, I work um, at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center uh, full-time and try to farm and ranch part-time on the weekends. Um, and in this position, it's given me the opportunity to use to work with a lot of people like Carl Hoppe and others who have educated me about uh, different opportunities through the SARE program. And uh, it's sort of opened up my eyes to different opportunities for management, uh, like bale grazing. And so um, with these opportunities, it's hopefully going to give me an opportunity to transition back um, to an operation that will be sustainable for myself and for our family as well. Uh, I'm Drew Geidler. Um, I just want to say thanks to Sarah. It's been a really enjoyable process so far. I, I worked away for about 10 years from the farm, and I came back in 2015. Uh, worked all over the world, saw a lot of different techniques in agriculture, different regional schemes and, and ecosystems. Um, so this is where we live, where, where we grew up. 14 miles north of the South Dakota border. Um, I've, I've moved into my great-grandfather's home and renovating that. It's been a long and slow process. <coughs> right here is where my great-grandfather um, settled and our bale grazing area that we're going to focus on is right over here. Uh, she should also pay attention to the surrounding landscapes, uh, just looking at the degradation of the, the land. So this progresses from 57 to 95. Uh, in 57, early 50s, where we're bale grazing, or where we are going to bale graze, um, they had farmed it to the point where it wasn't even raising an oats crop and they walked away from it. It, it blew away the soil. Uh, and you can see all that white that is not alkali, that's clay pan. The soil is blown away, it's just down to the subsoil. And to the east, that's uh, sandy hilltops that are blown away. Um, 2004, the bale grazing area where we're going to be working on, that progressed. Um, they didn't plant it back to anything back in the 50s, but it reverted back to native, mostly blue grama and buffalo grass, some sedges. But to the east, look at all those, all that washing. Um, this. This was farmed weed on weed on weed for about a hundred years, and it's a big button. Yes. Yeah. So this strip farming weed on weed on weed. This area was planted back to alfalfa and brome grass, and that was just left to go to whatever it reverted to um, blue grama and buffalo grass. Um, so, 2010, there was a ownership change and the owner requested the person that rented it um, plant in alfalfa. It was better than cropping it, but it, you see an alfalfa field, there's still a lot of bare ground. Um, to the west, it's still slow. On its, on its growth back. So focused in on our area, that up there is more alkaline, high water table. First thing we did was trenched in water lines. There's a water tank here and I'm actually in the process of trenching to get a water tank down here. Um, 2017, 
we had eight inches of annual precip that year. So um, that's why you see a lot more of the clay pan showing through. It wasn't covered up with vegetation. Um, an area to the north of here has degraded at the same rate. And so you're seeing high water table. That's where the alkaline's coming from. And it's you know, traveling down. Uh, I'll let you talk for a little bit. So given some of the history um, that Drew talked about, there was some obvious concerns that came up, of course. We watched the soil loss happening, um, whether it was through summer fallow practices to the north of us, um, different management that was happening on that landscape over time. We also saw concerns with water management. Um, there's been several talks throughout this com conference um, of watching water run off the landscape. And I think um, one of Drew's main priorities and objectives with his operation is to try to increase that water holding capacity uh, as much as possible and uh, I know that we are in East River and so the challenges here are very different than the challenges that we have out west um, this year for instance we were loving it um, the moisture was we were ready for more if we had the opportunity to capture it um, just to kind of put that into perspective for you so managing um, that water and trying to capture it uh, was a focus for this project um, by doing the bale grazing, trying to spread out that residue, holding more of that moisture, ultimately holding more of the nutrients that would be coming from the actual grazing component of those livestock. And capturing the neighbor so. And <laughs> uh, as Drew just mentioned, if you didn't hear him, uh, he really enjoys capturing uh, the neighbor's dirt as it's flying um, and trying to take advantage of the water as well um, because it, it presents a lot of opportunities to quickly um, capture a resource that uh, is, a, is a slower process to build and so if we can put that resource on the ground and promote some uh, biological activity to remediate it, it's something that we're trying to do as well. Uh, and then the other, uh, the other resource concern that went along kind of as a symptom of the soil loss um, as well as limited water management became the poor, poor forage production and a reduced quality. Um, so this is just some pictures that kind of go through and highlight those resource concerns that we had. You can see some uh, fence line pictures here where there's an obvious um, difference where this area had been farmed. Um, some of these areas, it's as much of a two or a three feet drop. Um, cattle trailing over here. Um, I have a couple of videos here just to show some of the soil loss that was happening. If they will play. So this is actually over the hill from my brother's place at my at our parents' place. That's dirt flying. That's, that's 2017. It's not the dirty 30s. And then this video next to it is the road ditch. where uh, some people are able to normally hay that area for. That was alfalfa and grass that tall. That was one storm. Uh, and then this picture here is in Drew's yard. Uh, directly to the north is where that area had been summer followed. So there's a culvert here. Um, whenever it rains, we like to watch the water run off of the neighbor's place and flood through that culvert. Um, and rather than watching it go through our land and down into the next neighbors and on and on and on, trying to capture that. Mm 
And then this is um, in our study area where um, the soil is um, a bit of a challenge. A lot of exposed <coughs> clay pan areas, as Drew mentioned, some alkali challenges. So Aaron, you, that area is mostly no-till, right? So is, it, is the soil blowing off of just these exposed clay pans or? The area to the, to the north has been summer fallowed for about the last 30? Yeah, so the area to the direct north has been managed in summer fallow since 1924. Um, and most of that is what you're directly seeing, but that's what you're directly seeing, you know, on those windstorms coming from the north to the south um, through his yard there. So uh, the project that we proposed, Fail Grazing to Build Soil Health, um, was essentially designed, of course, to meet um, uh, the project objectives that I have outlined here, to improve soil health and fertility, to increase our nutrient cycling, reduce runoff. Um, we also wanted to, as a result of those efforts, um, build our soil productivity in hopes of building our forage production and quality. Um, and then for ourselves as producers, um, being able to reduce some of the feed and the labor costs, uh, which we enjoy um, working with our cattle. And um, we do hear lots of comments about um, wanting to be able to go out and see the cattle every day. And we do have that opportunity with bale grazing. Um, and so for some folks, the idea and the concept of not starting the tractor every single day and being able to go out and look at those animals is a challenge for them. Um, but it was an interesting opportunity with this project because our location was next to the highway. Um, and so when we began this project, there was a lot of uh, skepticism over what we were doing and how, it, you know, why did we have our cattle out with our bales and um, people not seeing us taking care of our cattle. Um, and yet they would drive by on their way to the sale barn or they would drive by every day to come out and feed their own cattle. And they would observe that our cattle um, were taken care of, but they weren't seeing us out there all of the time. And uh, they struggled with that. And so having the location was helpful for us actually to start a lot of conversations with those folks um, from the what are you doing and why are you doing this and um, having that evolve with the project over time into people stopping by and asking us more questions, which has been a really good opportunity to, um, to work with those folks as well. And then um, also to take opportunities like this to share through different outreach efforts. Um, in various ways, we serve on different boards in our communities, and so there's opportunities there to share about our projects. Uh, there's um, different tours where people can come out, and um, we call it like a mailbox tour. Um, the information's available in the mailbox, and they can kind of come out on their own and, and look uh, Sometimes we struggle with the different um, conventional ideas of outreach because we feel like the, the people that do need to hear that information, um, they may not be ones to attend those events. And so we're hoping that through this project we can reach out to different groups that might not be here today with us. So here you can see the bales are tipped on end and some there's there's some areas in between. We just run a polyelectric wire. Uh, we started out with two polyelectric wires to limit the cows into about a week's worth of hay. And then when the cows get into a group, they are somewhat limited at going into all the bales at once by the net wrap. Um, but also before that, 
you need water. So this is my wintering, um, and it's used by a solar well that's in my yard and is tied into another well that pumps at night, um, but this is just during the day. Um, water comes up and you've got a ground sink for the, the ground temperature to keep your water tank open. Um, we never had a problem with, uh, with keeping water to our cattle. Uh, and that's what most talks, my, my experience is they don't get into the why and the how. And it's good to be theoretical and it's good to talk about the benefits, but this is how I water the cattle. There's no heater, there's no nothing. If, if the water tank is getting frozen all the time or you're having trouble with it building up around the float, stick a siphon hose in. You can run some water out on the ground. Water has a great heat source and uh, it's cheaper than running a propane heater or an electric heater, so by just pumping a little water with solar. Uh, we provided wind brakes. We're unloading panels. I can see a little dog there. Um, we found that the cattle would much rather stand behind a bale and eat than stand behind a steel windbreak. Um, but the windbreaks were useful on the cleanup days, the last couple days in each rotation, the cattle would use them. And it, it was good for during, you know, winter storms and stuff because there wasn't um, any natural wind protection out there. The this is all permanent fencing. Um, part of the program we did plant trees along this area for a long-term uh, solution because we're planning on continuing this. Uh, we plan, we put the portable windbreaks about in here and in here, and the water tank, the winterized water tank is right there. We would kind of do a pie shape out of here from with the electric wire, and then down here it was more of a brake feeding where they would just progressively go through the system and trail back. Um, this is about 45 acres, and you can see this is this is season-long cover crops that I planted. I think this was 2018, and then I was hauling in CRP hay, so instead of driving over and tearing the mirrors off the truck. I cut a couple strips to get in there, but we grazed the cover crops first and then distributed the bales. That's us after we progressed to a single wire. Um, once the cattle got used to the, the hot in the ground, um, we didn't have any trouble with them challenging it. Um, so it's just much easier when it's, you know, 20 below zero and the wind's blowing and snow to just roll up one wire by yourself when you're out there. Um, and everybody talks about waste. Do you see much for waste? And that's kind of how the cattle eat it. They start at the top of the bale and they just work it down. Um, I challenge anyone to look at their bale feeder in the corral and look at that amount of waste. And, and those cows haven't quite, I mean, they haven't gotten to a cleanup day yet. A lot of that will disappear still. But that isn't, that isn't bad for, in, in my books. Um, this is in the winter. Cows are happy there. <laughs> For every bale, the snow swirls around, and there's a clear area around the bale, and the cattle can drop down to them. Um, they actually clean up the hay better when there's high snow amounts because 
they're lazy. I mean, they're like humans. And I guess I'll just stand here and eat this. Even though they can see a bale over there, they don't want to walk over there and get it. They'd rather just, well, eat this one until it's gone. So the efficiency on the hay utilization was better, but on the other side, sometimes you kind of wish they would leave a little more residue. Um, so uh, this is them just starting in. So start at the top, work their way down. We don't we don't cut the net wrap. Um, a couple days before we move the cattle, I'll go out and pick up the net wrap off the ground. Cows don't want to eat it, so they ball it up and they just kind of push it off to the side usually. Um, and I don't want to go out there and unwrap all the bales and let them into all the bales at once. And if it's really bad winter, I'll just wait till spring and go out there and take a day in the spring and pick up the net wrap. Is that like a diet plan or what's the reason yeah. behind the waiting? I mean, because I mean, <clears throat> we cut all the twine off, but I, I mean, we don't do twine. The twine. Does, or I mean, the net wrap, I'm sorry. It's plastic. And mostly it's to deter them from getting into all the bales at once. Because oh. they'll, make, they'll make, I mean, there'll be more haze foliage because they'll bed on it then. Yeah. Where, It'll be, enough, so once they break into that bale, they stay on there and work on that bale before yeah. they decide to go to another one and have to break into that bale all over again. And it's funny, they'll find like the bales it, that they like and they the bales they don't seek like. It out. <laughs> if the bale was made a little wet, you know, through a bottom and there's some spoilage in it, it doesn't smell right, it'll sit there and sit there and they they won't look at it. So And that's a ball of net wrap they pushed off to the side, and that's the res residue. I mean, it's... Can you zoom in on that at all? That second one on the I'm not sure how. <coughs> Later, I can show you. <laughs> uh, if there is any um, evidence of, uh, you know, like if we feel like we didn't get a lot of the net wrap or things were frozen down because we tried to pick it up earlier, um, we did modify a harrow to where uh, we can put that on and drag that through and that um, collects a lot of the net wrap. But we're still trying to figure out the right management with that as well because uh, we feel like the more you disturb some of that residue, um, you're kind of losing some of the benefits of having, you know, that residue holding, the urea holding, you know, those potential nutrients. And we don't want to lose a lot of that to the air. And so we're trying to figure out the right balance there, whether it is using a harrow or whether it's maybe that next spring in a, in a hay field where you have bale graze, rather than taking that first cutting, maybe what we do is we actually graze that off and their hoof action um, can agitate it a little bit, but not uh, cause too much agitation too quickly to where we lose those nutritional um, benefits. Hopefully With our soon it'll all be biodegradable, right? <laughs> we did the no, we don't like to. Do that. Well, no, <laughs> we'll be about it. Yeah. Um, we did do um, some basic soil sampling um, with our project from basically the beginning and then an ending. Um, and so you can see here there was a cover crop only sampling, a bale graze area um, where there was a cover crop, and then um, a bale graze and cover crop, but there wasn't a direct impact. So, yeah, the difference between those two is that um, the direct impact was um, a sample that was collected underneath where that bale had been placed in that bale grazing area, and this one was outside of that, the bale. Um, just going through, um, without, I guess, diving too much into it, 
there's a, a general theme of um, nutrients um, with the exception of pH. Um, organic matter hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, but some of these initial samples showed quite a difference here in the phosphorus, potassium, solute, um, zinc, manganese, copper. Um, and I'm not surprised that we didn't see a change here. I think that's a long-term thing. Um, did you want to comment on the pH at all? And this, this is only a snapshot, so uh, that's one thing I will put out there. Um, just so you're aware, it's a, you know, a one-time sample, but um, in 2019, this imagery just came out, which was really helpful. Um, here's just a close-up area um, of our project, and you can kind of see the distribution of where some of those bales have been placed. Um, interestingly, 2019 we had a lot of moisture so yes the areas are green um, but there's still a, a change and a difference that you can see here the bale areas are much darker um, we can see a production difference in terms of like the height of that biomass uh, so we're still noticing differences in those years even when it's not dry This is just a close-up picture of an area where the bale had been. So the bale was sitting right in here. That was in late October. <laughs> There's various opportunities where people start asking you questions, um, even getting phone calls, because they saw all of our cows in with our bales, and they were driving down the highway, and they didn't want our cows to eat those bales. Um, but we still feel like there's quite a need um, to reach out to those people and so if any of you have different ideas of, of reaching out to them or um, sharing them the information that you know some of us we all have some of that information here but how do we reach out to those people soil sampling that we did um, was in this area mostly um, and so the pH I guess that I said I didn't want to comment on uh, the soil can vary in a matter of I mean feet which I saw you saw in that picture of the clay pan and we wanted to have a direct spot of testing to compare as close as possible rather than a, a cumulative sample. But even within that small area, we got a surprising results on our pH. Um, but we think we were representative because the organic matter was the same throughout the test. And the baseline that I had done before, uh, well, shortly after I acquired this land in 2015, was similar too. So, um, but but you can see the overall trend. And the outreach, uh, yeah, the the main thing that I like about it is the non-traditional outreach. Uh, the people that should be here or not. The people that have the most to gain aren't listening. They're not at extension events. They're uh, who knows where they're at. <laughs> um, so going forward, um, we'd like to expand our bale grazing area uh, more to the land east of where I live. Um, experiment with some pasture clay pan areas. Uh, the pasture was season long grazed it was opened up into i think the pasture was about about 1200 acre pasture altogether, season long and there was one well on it so that's where you'd see the trailing um, 
I'd like to um, continue to experiment with management and reducing our labor. Um, last winter, I blew a lot of snow with my tractor, but um, I only used a half a tank of diesel fuel all last winter for feeding the cows. Um, if I can drive that a little bit more. Um, the only time I'd start a tractor was when I wasn't ready for the cows to move because they were in the last couple days of cleaning up an area and there was a blizzard coming in. I didn't want to move them to the next set of bales because <coughs> then they'd cover up that hay, res that hay that they were cleaning up. And I don't like to see that waste, I guess. So I would feed them a few bales to get them through the storm. And then a, a few days later, let them into the next set of bales. Um, Aaron talked about residue management. Um, yeah, we'd like to experiment with grazing that area rather than having to harrow. Some, sometimes when a blizzard would happen, you didn't realize you had all that hay there. And it would get a little thick and, I mean, you don't want dead spots out in your alfalfa field or in your pasture, so we'd like to do some select spot residue management trials. Um, we'd like to incorporate multi-species grazing. Uh, we expect that to be a pretty good challenge with getting sheep to respect a one-wire fence when sheep generally you need <coughs> woven wire and lots and lots of strands of barbed wire and electric and um, we'd like to experiment with the incorporation of byproducts because sometimes where we're at um, forage quality isn't great you know when we we're in a drought in 2017 I had to buy a lot of hay um, I was so uh, you know, and so you wonder what to do in, in that case when you don't have the protein adequate from alfalfa and grass. Uh, I'd also like to experiment with straw windbreaks, whether that's flax, rye, whatever's available. Um, I expect a cow would rather stand behind a windbreak that's of that sort than a steel portable windbreak and then how long would it last, you know. The, the more comfortable you can keep a cow during adverse winter weather, um, the better condition you're gonna keep her in. So that, that's kind of where we're, we're thinking. Yeah. Um, what are the benefits of multi-species grazing? We're hoping to see a change in um, the utilization of the feed and uh, some of the parasite control. Through a procedural question, as you, uh, how many years have you done this now? We did one year in the bale grazing. One year bale grazing. Okay. As you look at the, the, the green areas, and you go in with your next year, are you going to stage those bales the next year in between the green spots so that you tend to get a you know yeah. good coverage of the field where you're laying out those beds. Yes, we'd uh, we'd like to we'd like to move it, and then we'd also looking down the road if we're going to do it, you know, for the next 20 years or whatever. That's why we'd like to include the additional acreage to the east. Um, we don't know what the nutrient buildup will be long term, so the longer you can or you can distribute it, the better we can get the benefits, I guess. So. I also noticed in the pictures on your drainages, <clears throat> is it possible to concentrate your bales along that drainage? Because that's where you got a lot was, of bales. It was area. way too wet is it? Um, at that time. Pretty high in clay? That area was, yeah. Um, yeah, it's... It's still really soft, like this winter, I tried to get out there in those spots and I just kept breaking through. And the springs are running out of those high areas, actually. So. 